introduction to limbs during this lecture we will uh, have a broad look at uh, the upper limb and the lower limb main topics to be uh, studied in these uh, two limbs is uh, first it is the skeleton now uh, when you start the sections of the upper limb as well as the lower limb uh, before you embark on dissections you go through an osteology session where you take each and every bone and study details of these bones uh, and then you take bones and articulate them put them together in, in their usual joints and see um, how, how, how the two ends match each other and how the movements take place then uh, you, you once you start the dissections um, you study the superficial veins and nerves first the, the, the moment you remove the skin and go into the subcutaneous tissue you will start seeing these superficial veins uh, and uh, cutaneous so superficial nerves uh, which uh, travel in the, uh, the subcutaneous fat layer um, superficial to the uh, deep fascia uh, it is important to remember that you don't have to know the names of all the cutaneous nerves and superficial veins but you should know the general arrangement of superficial veins uh, the names of main superficial uh, veins etc when it comes to cutaneous nerves again you don't have to know all the names of cutaneous nerves but there are certain cutaneous nerves that are clinically important uh, then you know you will have to uh, know the names of these um, cutaneous nerves now this is one reason why you need to uh, read a clinical anatomy book uh, parallel to your um, textbook reading and um, dissections uh, and you know following lectures uh, remember this point from the beginning then uh, this concept of dermatomes and myotomes uh, in both limbs when you study you should know the dermatomal uh, map and you should know uh, uh, the, the segmental supply uh, of uh, each muscle which is called myotomes by definition dermatome is uh, an area of skin supplied by a single spinal nerve uh, or single spinal cord segment and similarly uh, myotome is an area of muscle supplied by a single spinal nerve or spinal cord segment uh, now the importance of knowing about dermatomes and myotomes is that uh, if you check a given uh, dermatome and if the sensations are not intact then that gives you an idea about the uh, the integrity or the, uh, or the about the, uh, the, the spinal nerve and the spinal segment if there is a damage to the spinal nerve and the spinal segment the, the you will not uh, detect any sensation at the dermatomal level and uh, similar with the myotomes um, you check the myotomes uh, by checking uh, uh, reflexes um, now there are different reflexes biceps jerk knee jerk uh, ankle jerk etc uh, now when you uh, do a reflex checking if the reflex is absent uh, or if the reflex is exaggerated then you get an idea about the, uh, the spinal nerves and segments supplying it sometimes even uh, the higher uh, centers uh, acting on these uh, segmental uh, levels so all these things you will learn um, little by little uh, you need to give it time and then uh, you will understand it then muscles um, there are many muscles in the upper limb uh, and, and lower limb uh, it's sometimes it's not easy to remember all the, uh, the origins and insertions uh, uh, actions uh, nerve supply of muscles uh, rather you uh, group them uh, and you learn them in compartments now for instance um, you learn the muscles of the anterior compartment of the arm or the posterior compartment of the arm forearm anterior compartment of the forearm or the posterior compartment of the forearm uh, and then you know you um, you learn uh, their common actions and uh, usually you know they have a common nerve supply uh, and then that is how you remember it rather than taking individual muscles and trying to remember all the details about uh, muscles then nerve plexus when it comes to the upper limb uh, the nerve plexus that supplies the upper limb is the brachial plexus and when it comes to the lower limb it is the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus uh, sometimes the sacral plexus is uh, called lumbosacral plexus uh, because there is a contribution from the lumbar plexus to the sacral plexus we will go in, into little bit of details of these plexus uh, after some time uh, now the, the, the plexus uh, nerve plexus um, 
is a uh, network of nerves there are certain spinal nerves uh, coming they are uniting and uh, forming uh, uh, a common nerve trunks and these trunks will uh, divide again and they reunite uh, in different ways and then uh, branches are given from that uh, there are several advantages of nerve plexus one advantage is that if you have uh, say c5 uh, this is c6 this is c7 this is c8 like this there are different uh, uh, spinal segments um, these spinal segments are uh, united then then only they divide into branches so that the nerves that you get ultimately will have several spinal segments in there not one uh, spinal segment so one nerve can carry several spinal segments because of this mixing up similarly uh, if you get another branch here you will have c5 or c6 here also in these branches so another advantage is that um, uh, same spinal segment can go in different nerves rather than having uh, one nerve starting from one place and going into all the areas uh, so you get uh, uh, nerves carrying several spinal segments and several spinal uh, given spinal segment appearing in several nerves both are uh, huge advantages when it comes to uh, nerve supply of limbs then uh, uh, both in upper limb and lower limb there are special areas now one such area is axilla it's a very important area uh, this area is found just above the armpit then the cubital fossa of the upper limb that is uh, in front of the, um, the elbow joint it's again an important area uh, you you should know all the relationships uh, all the boundaries of uh, these uh, special regions then uh, the other area in the upper limb is the carpal tunnel uh, it's a fibro we call it a fibro osseous tunnel because on one side you get uh, carpal bones like this you know what are carpal bones and on the other side you get a fibrous um, fibrous tissue uh, retinaculum we call it flexor retinaculum uh, fibrous tissue on the other side and in the in the in the in the tunnel there are certain structures passing through this fibro osseous tunnel uh, and you know there are clinical implications of that uh, these structures can get compressed um, so that is carpal tunnel then uh, there is a snuff box you call it anatomical snuff box uh, an area behind the, uh, the, the root the, the base of the thumb um, there is a little bit of clinical importance there as well then uh, when it comes to the upper limb uh, femoral triangle uh, the anterior aspect of the thigh there is an area called femoral triangle um, many structures important structures are there uh, then you get popliteal fossa behind the, uh, the knee uh, just like uh, cubital fossa in the, in the upper limb in the lower limb you get the popliteal fossa then you get the gluteal region in relation to the lower limb uh, that is the buttock area so these are some of the special areas that you will study when you do the, uh, the upper limb and lower limb then the joints and ligaments uh, there are several joints in both uh, these uh, limbs and uh, you need to know a uh, few uh, things about these uh, joints uh, and the, the factors uh, stabilizing or maintaining these joints sometimes uh, it is uh, bony factors muscle factors or ligament factors uh, and in joints like uh, knee joint which is just uh, the upper end of the two bones are flat so to maintain the joint uh, you have to have very strong ligaments so then you you study about the ligaments as well then the arterial anastomosis um, uh, now when there is an artery like this uh, uh, which gives branches and supplying you know some structures and there's another artery uh, supplying some other area sometimes branches of this artery uh, anastomose or unite with the branches of the other artery uh, the advantage of that is uh, if uh, this artery gets blocked proximal to this anastomosis uh, there is always possibility of blood coming through this artery uh, passing through these uh, anastomotic vessels and uh, supplying the uh, distal end of the block artery so that if it is uh, say a limb the distal end of the limb uh, can be maintained through this circulation so these circulations are also called collateral uh, circulations then the limb drainage uh, 
Lift drainage is also important to remember. Uh, the, the importance is different uh, from area to area. Uh, certain uh, all the structures that you learn, all the organs that you learn um, in the anatomy department, you you have to have some idea about the lift drainage. But certain areas uh, nobody will uh, bother about the lift drainage. Now I will give you one example when it comes to the, the abdominal structures. Uh, the, the lymph drainage of the stomach is uh, extremely important, uh, but uh, nobody uh, is bothered about the lymph drainage of the spleen. Uh, so it's something like that. Uh, when it comes to upper limb and lower limb, the, the lower limb lymph drainage might be more important than the upper limb uh, lymph drainage. Uh, you can argue on that. Um, so this is how the, the topics uh, will be. Um, lined up. Skeleton of the limbs, now there are uh, uh, many uh, similarities between the, uh, the arrangement of bones of the upper limb and the lower limb and there are few very small uh, differences between the two. Now uh, before that you should know uh, the, the difference between the axial skeleton and the, the appendicular skeleton. Uh, axial skeleton uh, consists of the, the skull and the mandible of course uh, and the vertebral column with the sacrum uh, then you get the, uh, the, the rib cage and the sternum. So these uh, uh, constitute the axial skeleton which is uh, in the center. Then um, you get the appendicular uh, skeleton. Appendicular skeleton consists of when it comes to the upper limb uh, you get uh, a clavicle here and a uh, scapula uh, which connects the, uh, the upper limb skeleton to the axial skeleton. So you get the humerus here and then the rest of the bones here. Uh, so you get uh, axial skeleton, then you get appendicular skeleton. In the appendicular skeleton you have the upper limb bones as well as the, uh, the part that connects the upper limb to the axial skeleton which is uh, in this case called the, either you call it shoulder girdle or pectoral girdle or pectoral girdle then uh, when it comes to the lower limb there is a similar girdle a limb girdle that connects the lower limb to the, uh, the axial skeleton um, so it is uh, called uh, the, you get the, the two hip bones united by uh, symphysis pubis here here they are connected to the uh, the sacrum, mm, so you get the uh, the femur uh, attached to uh, attached to the axial skeleton through the uh, the girdle here. This girdle is called pelvic girdle. Pelvic uh, girdle. Uh, so this is the general arrangement of the uh, the axial skeleton and the, the appendicular skeleton. Uh, remember that um, when you go into the details. Otherwise, you will forget this fact. Then, uh, if you go to the details of the bones, uh, before that, you divide the, uh, the upper limb. Now, you, when it comes to general English terms, you uh, very loosely use terms um, to indicate different parts of the limbs. But when it comes to studying medicine, you have to have specific names for different parts of the limbs. Now, the first part of the, uh, the upper limb, if you take the upper limb first, first part of the upper limb is called arm or uh, some people call it upper arm both are correct terms arm or upper arm then uh, below that you get the forearm this forearm uh, then you get the hand these are the three main parts hand uh, consists of uh, carpus metacarpus and five digits so carpus is here and this is the metacarpus and these are the, uh, the, the digits or fingers. When it comes to the lower limb, uh, of course, you know, we talked about the shoulder girdle and the uh, hip or the uh, pelvic girdle. Uh, then uh, when it comes to the lower limb, um, similar to this one, you call this part thigh. You don't call it upper thigh though. Okay, it's thigh. Then the next part is uh, leg, and the third part is foot. Foot consists of uh, a tarsus, metatarsus, and five digits. So your tarsus is here, just like carpus. 
then your metatarsus is here consisting of five metatarsal bones and you get your digits here. Now uh, coming back to the upper limb, uh, uh, the, the carpus, this one here consists of eight bones in four in each row. There's a proximal row of four bones and there's a distal row of, you know what is proximal and distal, there's a distal row of four bones. Uh, then uh, when it comes to the, the metacarpus, there are five uh, metacarpal bones and when it comes to digits, uh, there are of course there are five digits. In the thumb, first one, there are two phalanges, there are two phalanges. Uh, then uh, all the other uh, fingers, there are three phalanges each, there are three phalanges each. Uh, again, uh, coming uh, back to the lower limb, uh, there is a difference. Uh, now the carpus had eight bones, tarsus had only has only seven bones. Uh, two bones have fused and formed one bone. Therefore, you get uh, instead of eight, you get only seven bones here. Uh, metatarsus is the same; it consists of five metatarsal bones, and uh, of course there are five digits. Uh, the, 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 the big toe. The first one uh, consists of two um, phalanges and the uh, other uh, four uh, toes consist of um, three uh, phalanges uh, each. So this is the general arrangement of the, uh, the skeleton of the, uh, the upper limb and the uh, lower limb. Superficial veins and uh, nerves. Uh, first I will show you some of the superficial nerves that could be important. Uh, for you to remember, I can I cannot tell you the names of all the superficial nerves that you might have to remember due to different reasons. But it's too early; you cannot grasp all that if I tell you now. Uh, you have to uh, develop that knowledge gradually. But for the moment, I'll give you some examples. Now you can see this uh, supraclavicular nerves. Uh, these nerves carry uh, C four C four. Uh, spinal segment therefore this area this is the tip of the shoulder area uh, supplied uh, by this uh, suprascapular so supraclavicular nerves uh, that that area that dermatome here is c4 dermatome because it is supplied by c4 uh, spinal segment now that is uh, one reason other reason is that uh, why you need to know this is that these are branches of the cervical plexus cervical plexus. Now we talked about a uh, little bit about the brachial plexus, uh, then lumbar plexus, uh, sacral plexus. Now the cervical plexus is above brachial plexus. Uh, so the cervical plexus is found in the neck and it uh, branches supply, supply the uh, neck. Um, so one of its branches, uh, several of its branches uh, are there which are called supraclavicular nerves. They supply the skin uh, at the tip of the shoulder and uh, uh, in the upper part of the thorax. Uh, I cannot use certain terms because you don't know them. It's above the sternal angle uh, supplied by supraclavicular nerves. Uh, and the other point is that there is uh, another clinical point, uh, pain from the diaphragm uh, is referred to the tip of the shoulder area. Uh, so this uh, referral pain is as a result of uh, Diaphragm, you know what is diaphragm, uh, Mahaprachire. Uh, diaphragm is also supplied by um, C4 segment, uh, and here it is also C4 segment. Therefore, pain arising from the diaphragm uh, will uh, uh, will be um, identified, uh, will get identified by the brain uh, as uh, pain coming from the tip of the shoulder. So that is called referred pain. There are different theories uh, for referred, referred pain. You will learn uh, all these theories uh, in physiology um, we don't go into details of that very much so that is you know one nerve therefore uh, you might remember then this one um, superior or upper lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm uh, so that uh, supplies uh, the area below the tip of the shoulder now this area was supplied by these nerves that I, as i mentioned before so this area is supplied by the, this uh, superior or you can call it upper lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm. Um, there is a muscle called deltoid muscle, it is a muscle called deltoid muscle like this in that area. So if you take the skin over the deltoid muscle, uh, 
this upper half of the skin of the deltoid muscle um, is the tip of the shoulder area supplied by C4. Then this lower half, skin over the lower half of the deltoid muscle uh, is the area supplied by the supra uh, superior lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm. Uh, now this nerve, cutaneous nerve, is a branch of the nerve called axillary nerve. Axillary nerve. Mm, axillary nerve is an important nerve in that area. It supplies this muscle. There are there are uh, muscular branches and cutaneous branches, motor and sensory branches of this nerve. Uh, so motor branches will supply the, the, the deltoid muscle and the, the sensory cutaneous branches will supply the skin over the lower half of the deltoid muscle. All these things you will learn, these are in clinical anatomy books. Uh, but uh, for this reason, uh, it is important to remember this uh, upper or you know superior lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm because it's a branch of an important nerve which is called the axillary nerve supplying the deltoid muscle. So this is how you, this is these are the reasons for you to remember some of these uh, names of some of these cutaneous nerves. Then you know for similar reasons in, in this intercostal brachial nerve you might remember it is T2. So the, I, I will not tell you all the reasons it's too much for you at this stage. Then uh, you get the, uh, the lateral uh, cutaneous nerve of the, the forearm. Uh, which is a, a, a branch of another uh, important nerve. Um, so then, you know, they, they are, you know, the superficial branch of the radial nerve. The radial nerve has got two branches uh, at, the, at the elbow. It divides in two branches, a deep branch and a superficial branch. A uh, deep branch is a muscular branch, an important muscular branch, which, sup which supplies all the muscles of the extensor compartment of the forearm, which again you will learn later. So superficial branch is a cutaneous nerve. It comes all the way uh, here and uh, supplies uh, this area of the, uh, the dosum of the um, hand. So this is a small account on the cutaneous nerves to show you the importance of knowing the names of some of the cutaneous nerves but not uh, all the cutaneous nerves. Then when it comes to uh, superficial veins, uh, you can see now this area, this is called superficial palmar arch. This is called, uh, sorry, this is called dorsal venous arch of veins. Dorsal venous arch of veins. Uh, from the dorsal venous arch, from the lateral side of the dorsal venous arch, uh, a vein starting which is called the cephalic vein. It is called cephalic vein. Uh, this is the lateral, it, it passes um, uh, proximally uh, over the lateral uh, side of the, uh, the forearm. Uh, you can call it either lateral uh, side or the radial side radial uh, to to uh, to mean that the uh, the radial uh, radius is on that side there are two bones here ulna bone and the radius so the radius is on the lateral side so that that border can be called either lateral border or radial border so the cephalic vein uh, travels you can see the name cephalic vein travels on the lateral border or the radial border of the forearm then from the uh, the, the ulna end or the medial end of the dorsal venous arch, dorsal venous arch, uh, another vein starts which is called the basilic vein. Basilic vein, you can see the name here, basilic vein. It runs along the medial border or the ulna border of the uh, forearm. Then uh, these are the two uh, veins. These veins are united by another vein, an important vein called median cubital vein. Median cubital vein, you can see the name here. Median cubital vein. Uh, this is uh, an important vein um, because uh, when you want to give injections, sometimes you use this vein and when you want to draw blood especially, this is the fa favorite site for drawing blood. Uh, then uh, you can see few more points here. The, the cephalic vein, now this is the lateral side or the radial side. This is the medial or the ulna side. Cephalic vein runs on the, the lateral side. Uh, it runs all the way on the lateral um, border of the forearm as well as the lateral border of the arm. And then uh, it, it passes through an area called delta pectoral groove here because there is a muscle here which is called the, uh, the pectoralis major muscle. Uh, 
and here you get uh, deltoid muscle. So it passes uh, between uh, these two muscles through a groove here, which is called delto pectoral. Sorry, delto uh, pectoral groove, and it uh, it uh, disappears, um, uh, piercing through a um, fascia here. We'll learn details about that later. Then the basilic vein, on the other hand, this one, which is on the medial border, uh, it uh, in, when, once it enters the arm, you know this arm, uh, it pierces deep fascia of the arm halfway through, or just below the halfway mark, uh, just below the halfway mark, uh, and it goes in and joins deep veins, deep veins in that area. And the deep veins will drain to the same area. This this will drain into the deep veins later. You will learn these details later, not now. So this is a better uh, looking diagram of the same uh, venous arrangement. So this is the dorsal venous uh, network or the dorsal venous arch, from which uh, on the lateral side starts the cephalic vein, and on the medial side starts the basilic vein, and they run along these uh, borders as I mentioned before. So this is a, a picture of an individual. Uh, you can identify this is the cephalic vein. Maybe that's drawn already. Yeah. So that is a cephalic vein uh, running all the way on the media, uh, the lateral border of the forearm and arm. Then um, this is the basilic vein. You can see the basilic vein there and the vein that unites the two is the median cubital vein. So that is the median cubital vein, which is used frequently for um, drawing blood as well as giving injections. Um, and as I said before, you can in this picture you can see the identify the deltoid muscle, and uh, this is not labeled. This is the pectoralis major muscle. This one, and this is the delta pectoral groove. Uh, you will see this during the dissections very clearly. Uh, and here, this is the fascia that it pierces, uh, which is called clavic pectoral fascia. Clavic pectoral fascia. Clavic pectoral fascia. And then it enters another vein, deep vein, which is called the axillary vein in that area. Axillary vein in this area, which you can't see here, because that is deep to this fascia. So that's why you dissect. That's why you cut the body and learn because uh, when you just uh, look at it superficially, you can't see certain things. You go deep and look at them. Um, then uh, about the dermatomes. Uh, now this uh, picture shows you the dermatomal map of the upper limb. Uh, this is how uh, it is seen anteriorly. This is anterior view and this is posterior posterior view. Uh, now in both views you can see uh, the spinal segments, how each uh, spinal segment supplies an area of skin. So this is uh, C4 dermatome, C5 dermatome, C6, uh, C7, C8, uh, T1 and T2. So it's in this direction. Okay, from C5, C, C, Actually, this C4, it, it does not belong to upper limb, it's the tip of the shoulder. Then when it comes to upper limb, it starts from the C5 and ends at uh, T2, roughly. Okay. T2 is the skin of the axilla area. Then posteriorly, this is how you see it. This is the posterior view. So, uh, so from C5, C6, C7, C8, T1, like this. Um, so, details uh, uh, we can take up later, not now. So you have to remember this dermatomal map, we can ask you. Then uh, to summarize, to give you a very short summary of the compartments, uh, now when you take the arm, you know what is arm, I said you can call it either arm or upper arm. Uh, now uh, that is the area uh, between the shoulder and the elbow joint. Now arm can be divided into two compartments, an anterior compartment and a posterior uh, compartment. Uh, the anterior com and, and this division is done by uh, two septa, uh, uh, fibrous septa, uh, lateral intermuscular septum on the lateral side and the medial intermuscular septum on the medial side. Now, few uh, points about this intermuscular septa. 
as you can see here uh, this is deep fascia and this is the periosteum of the uh, bone underneath which is the humerus in this case now uh, this intermuscular septa actually uh, uh, it, it fuses it actually is a continuation of the deep fascia and it continues as the periosteum of the bone here okay so this part only you call uh, lateral intermuscular septum here you call it deep fascia here you call periosteum but you cannot separate um, them from each other you will have to tear them off if you want to separate them from each other therefore this is a very tough uh, attachment so for some reason if uh, pressure increases in in either of these compartments uh, remember that it's a very well closed space so in a closed space if the pressure increases then uh, you can uh, understand that all the uh, blood vessels uh, and nerves uh, will get compressed even the muscles will get compressed inside this compartment uh, you will learn this later you call it compartment syndrome it's, this is not the time to uh, talk about in detail but just remember this point uh, the intermuscular septa uh, they are uh, continuation of the deep fascia um, deep uh, into the uh, bone as the periosteum it continues therefore it's a firm attachment now coming back to the anterior compartment uh, the anterior compartment of the arm there are three muscles uh, coracobrachialis muscle uh, biceps brachii muscle and brachialis muscle coracobrachialis is a it's a very insignificant small muscle uh, the other two uh, the, the biceps brachii and brachialis are the, the two important uh, muscles in that compartment um, and uh, make it a point uh, to remember these uh, terms correctly so you can't uh, make mistakes when you write these uh, anatomical terms uh, here and there you can make mistakes but if you make mistakes repeatedly uh, we will deduct marks during the exam so whenever you learn a new term like this you you write it down on a piece of paper and learn the spellings now uh, uh, the muscles of the anterior compartment uh, are these three muscles the nerve that supplies all three muscles is the musculocutaneous nerve okay so there's one nerve supplying all these three muscles and these are the segments spinal cord segments that supply all these three muscles so if you learn them in groups uh, you can see that it's not very difficult you don't have to remember names of three nerves and uh, three different types of segments supplying the three muscles in the same nerve and the same segment when it comes to the posterior compartment this one it's very easy there's only one muscle there's very large muscle uh, with uh, it has three heads of course but it's a very large muscle single muscle supplied by um, the radial nerve uh, through c7 and c8 uh, spinal cord uh, segments so this is the uh, the reason why you have to learn them in compartments it's easy uh, to remember when it comes to the forearm uh, again uh, there is an anterior compartment as you can see here and a posterior compartment but the difference here compared to the arm in the forearm uh, is that uh, each of these compartments has uh, two uh, layers of muscles a superficial layer of muscles and a, a deep layer of muscles here also in the posterior compartment you have a superficial and a deep layer and uh, the anterior compartment both in the arm and forearm uh, can also be called flexor compartment because the flexor muscles are in that compartment you can call it flexor compartment and this one can be called extensor compartment okay it's posterior or the extensor uh, compartment uh, there are several muscles there are many muscles actually in this uh, in these uh, compartments anterior compartment uh, and the posterior compartment I'm not going into the details of the names of the muscles, but uh, a small point here: if you uh, see the if the name of the muscle um, is uh, I cannot show you name here. If say you know say you call it uh, you have a muscle flexor carpi radialis or flexor carpi ulnaris. Similarly, you can have extensor in the extensor compartment, posterior compartment, extensor carpi radialis, uh, longus brevis, then extensor carpi ulnaris. 
wherever you know if you see this term ka pi ka pi that means uh, the, the insertion is to the carpal bones or the base of the um, meta carpal bones and the action is on the wrist so it moves the wrist if it is a flexor it will flex the wrist if it is an extensor it will extend the wrist so extensor ka pi means it extends the wrist and its attachment is, uh, is also around the wrist not at the digits of the fingers uh, digits of the fingers and flexor ka pi means it flexes the um, wrist joint and radialis uh, means that it is on the radial side and ulnaris means it's on the ulna side so it's one way of uh, knowing the, uh, the action and the, the place or the position of muscles and roughly to get an idea about the attachment of muscles going by the name then uh, if you see a name like this uh, this is flexor digitorum now flexor means it's a flexor of the it's, it's a flexor digitorum means fingers so it's a flexor of fingers and superficialis means it's in the superficial uh, com superficial subcompartment of the, uh, the anterior compartment so the, the whole name has a meaning flexor digitorum superficialis okay being in the superficial um, compartment uh, it uh, flexes the, the digit at interphalangeal joints so if you have several phalanges uh, i said in uh, the thumb there are two and in other fingers uh, there are three phalanges so it bends the, uh, the fingers at these joints these are called phalanges and these are therefore interphalangeal joints these are phalanges these are interphalangeal joints uh, so there is another muscle here which is called um, flexor digitorum profundus okay so that is uh, that is in this compartment because it is not superficialis okay uh, then uh, now when you see this term it says flexor pollicis longus pollicis means it, it refers to thumb okay so wherever you see this uh, term pollicis that indicates the thumb so this uh, flexor is a flexor of the thumb and longus means it's a long muscle usually if you have a longus that means there is a brevis also brevis is a short muscle okay so for you to have a flexor pollicis longus there should be a flexor pollicis brevis also okay um, so that you will learn later um, then similarly you get this you know other names that i mentioned um, so this one it says uh, pronator quadratus because pronator means it's it's a pronator of the forearm there is a movement in the forearm called uh, pronation and there's another movement called supination or supination you have learned these movements during the first lecture and quadratus means it's like a, um, it, it's quadrangular okay that's why you call it uh, quadratus so when you learn the uh, the names of these muscles and remember uh, have a have a reason for you to uh, have that name sometimes you cannot find reasons of course but uh, wherever you can find a reason try to remember it uh, with the uh, reason then the other important thing here you can see that uh, now in the in the arm uh, the anterior compartment was supplied by the musculocutaneous nerve all three muscles and the posterior compartment there was one muscle uh, the triceps supplied by the radial nerve here the anterior compartment uh, is supplied by mainly by the median nerve and there is a small contribution uh, on the media uh, the medial side by the ulna nerve it's mainly supplied by the median nerve then the posterior compartment uh, is uh, supplied almost uh, totally supplied by uh, a nerve called posterior cutaneous uh, posterior interosseous nerve of the uh, posterior interosseous nerve uh, and this posterior interosseous nerve is none other than the deep branch of the radial nerve i said at the beginning uh, there are two branches uh, of the radial nerve given at the elbow the superficial branch and the, and the deep branch deep branch of the radial nerve is also called posterior interosseous nerve which supplies the posterior or the extensor compartment of the forearm when it comes to the hand uh, there are two sides now this is the palm palm side of the hand this is the palm and this is the dorsum back of the hand front of the hand and the uh, the back of the hand uh, now that is uh, something basic and then uh, if you look at the uh, the palm here if you look at the palm here you can see certain muscles now these muscles 
here in relation to the thumb are called thinner muscles and uh, these muscles in relation to the little finger here are called hypothena uh, muscles then uh, even though you cannot see here clearly there's another muscle here which is called adductor uh, pollicis muscle uh, adductor pollicis muscle because it's attached to the uh, thumb and there are uh, some other muscles deep here which are called uh, interosseous muscles and lumbrical muscles uh, then at the back there is the, the dorsum 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 uh, you see uh, you clearly see some of these interosseous muscles these are all interosseous muscles there are two types there is there are dorsal interosseous which are these actually and on the palm side you get this palm interosseous muscles which you cannot see in this uh, diagram it's okay because you will anyway see these things later now my point is all these muscles that i mentioned lumbricals dorsal and palm interosseous then uh, this uh, tina muscles here and hypothena muscles here and uh, the, the adductor pollicis all these muscles together if you take they have their origin and insertion insertion uh, both within the hand therefore they are called intrinsic muscles of the hand they are called intrinsic muscles they are called intrinsic muscles of the hand then uh, we mentioned that there are muscles in the forearm and arm now many of these muscles in the forearm uh, they enter the uh, hand now you can see some of these uh, muscle tendons uh, passing through the carpal tunnel here and entering the um, hand pass through the palm and uh, gets attached to these uh, phalanges here uh, different ones are attached to different phalanges so these the muscles long muscles these are called long flexor muscles and you have uh, long extensor muscles on the dorsal side these are called extensor muscles tendon now all these long muscles whether they are flexors or extensors they are called extrinsic muscles extrinsic muscles of the hand now you, you know the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic and you can understand that all the intrinsic muscles are very short muscles because they have their origin and insertion both within the hand and the extrinsic muscles are long uh, muscles remember this uh, point as well okay now we will take a look at uh, uh, the brachial plexus how the brachial plexus is formed um, now um, I will go into little bit of details about the brachial plexus uh, if you find it uh, too much at this stage uh, always you know go through it superficially and since this is a video recording and it should be available in the Moodle you can always revisit it and go through it again uh, when you actually start your uh, practicals in the form of videos uh, and later you know when you one day you know when you come to the faculty you will dissect um, these areas and see these structures with your naked eye now uh, therefore I will go into a little bit of details about the brachial plexus because some students find it difficult to understand at least at the initial stages of their um, learning period now the brachial plexus is formed by uh, five uh, spinal segments uh, C5, C6, C7, C8 and T1 so you can call it uh, fifth cervical, sixth cervical, seventh cervical, eighth cervical, and first thoracic um, spinal nerves. Now, spinal nerves uh, are uh, nerves coming now. If this is the spinal cord, um, spinal nerves are uh, uh, the, the nerves coming from uh, spinal cord segments. So, this is one spinal nerve coming out. Uh, this is its uh, posterior root, and this is its anterior root. Uh, so these spinal nerves are the ones that are um, shown here actually the spinal nerve divides into a posterior division and an anterior division this is anterior this is posterior now this is called anterior division is called anterior ramus posterior division is called posterior ramus actually when we say spinal nerves uh, we refer to uh, these anterior rami here anterior 
you can call it anterior primary ray myo also uh, anterior ray myo of the spinal nerve okay uh, so this is the spinal nerve this is anterior ray myo and the posterior ray myo uh, and this anterior ray myo of uh, c5 to t1 spinal nerves will contribute to form the brachial plexus so that is the first thing that you need to uh, remember here i will delete this uh, so you cannot uh, forget that fact uh, when you describe this then uh, this uh, anterior ray myo of the spinal nerve c5 to t1 uh, forms what are called roots roots of brachial plexus now this roots is put within brackets um, to indicate that they are not the actual nerve roots because uh, when you draw this uh, spinal cord as you have done before uh, you get this posterior and this is posterior and this anterior nerve roots which unite and form the uh, form the spinal nerve then only divided into anterior and posterior rami now these roots are the actual roots okay uh, so we should not forget that therefore uh, when it comes to roots of brachial plexus we put them uh, in within, within inverted uh, commas to indicate that um, they are not the real roots anyway so these are the roots of brachial plexus and uh, the roots um, they are located between uh, two muscles which i will not uh, mention here it's two neck muscles um, it's too much of detail and uh, the, these roots uh, if you take the first two roots c5 and c6 as you can see here they unite and form uh, one nerve and this is called a trunk this is called a trunk similarly the lower two uh, rami the, the roots lower two roots c8 and t1 roots unite and form one nerve that is also called a trunk then the middle root c7 continues as it is so these three trunks are called upper trunk this is called middle trunk and this is called lower trunk so uh, upper two um, roots of brachial plexus unite and form the upper trunk middle uh, uh, root of the brachial plexus c7 continues as the, uh, the, the middle trunk and the lower two roots c8 and t1 uh, combine and form the lower trunk so you have uh, trunks here you have roots here and trunks here then each trunk each of these trunks upper middle and lower trunk divides into an anterior division and a posterior division this is the anterior division this is the posterior division and the middle one which continued also divides into an anterior and a posterior division and this one also divides into an anterior division and a posterior division as you can see here all posterior divisions combine and form one nerve which is called the posterior cord posterior cord c o r d posterior cord then the anterior divisions of the upper trunk and the middle trunk here unite and form what is called lateral cord lateral cord and the anterior division of the lower trunk this one continues as the medial cord medial cord so ultimately you get a lateral cord a medial cord and a posterior cord now these cords lateral medial and posterior cords uh, they will give rise to branches that supply the upper limb now the lateral cord it's easy to remember uh, lateral cord gives off uh, three branches and the posterior cord gives off uh, five branches and the medial cord gives off five branches so if you go here you can see a lateral cord these are the three branches you will not be able to remember all that now and the medial cord there are five branches and the posterior cord again there are five branches names you can learn later okay coming back to this one again therefore what you need to remember here that at this level you get the roots of brachial plexus then these are the trunks then here you get the 
divisions, anterior and posterior divisions and here you get the codes, lateral, medial and posterior codes. Then uh, you get the branches here, branches. So branches, when it comes to branches, as I said before, it's 3, 5, 5. Now, there's another point that you can remember here. Now, uh, radial nerve, it's, it's the main nerve that supplies the posterior compartment of the arm. Radial nerve is actually branch from the posterior cord. Radial nerve is a branch of the posterior cord. Uh, and the ulna nerve, uh, it's, a, it's a branch of the medial cord. And the median nerve, on the other hand, uh, is actually uh, derived from both lateral and medial cords. You can see lateral and medial cords give two roots, uh, 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 a lateral root from the lateral cord and a medial root from the medial cord to form the median nerve. Uh, then uh, you can see another one. You can see uh, this one, musculocutaneous nerve. It is also given now from the lateral cord lateral cord and these are the these four nerves 1 2 3 and 4 musculocutaneous nerve radial nerve median nerve and the ulnar nerve are the four main nerves that supply the, uh, the upper limb muscles now uh, it is time for us to go through some of the special uh, regions uh, in the upper limb uh, as i mentioned in the first slide uh, I will not uh, go into the details of these areas. It's not easy for you to grasp it if I uh, give you the details. Just remember that uh, axilla uh, is uh, an important region which lies above the armpit. Now, if your arm is like this, uh, if this is your chest, uh, your armpit, uh, the, the skin of the armpit is here. Your axilla is here above the skin of the armpit uh, and uh, it, it connects the upper limb to the root of the neck. So the structures passing between the upper limb and the root of the neck has to pass through the uh, axilla. So that is the importance of the, uh, the axilla and uh, axilla has uh, several walls. Uh, there is uh, an uh, anterior wall here, uh, this one and there is a posterior wall here uh, and you have a medial wall uh, formed by the uh, the ribs, intercostal muscles and the, the, the serratus uh, anterior muscle, there is a muscle called serratus anterior muscle. Then uh, laterally there is a very narrow wall uh, at the uh, humerus. Uh, so this is the lateral wall, you call it the bicipital groove of the, uh, the humerus. Then uh, above, uh, it is like this, you have an area like this, uh, it is a pyramidal shaped area. So here you have an apex uh, which connects it to the root of the neck and you have a flow just above the armpit. So that is about the axilla. So details you will learn later, not now. Then the cubital fossa. Um, cubital fossa is an area in front of the, uh, the elbow, uh, elbow joint. So this is the elbow region. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, there are many uh, important arteries, veins and nerves. This is the median nerve. This is the brachial artery and these are uh, deep veins uh, in relation to the, the brachial artery and the deep veins in the limbs are called uh, venae committantes, venae committantes uh, of the uh, arms. Um, then, uh, then you can see you know, some of these uh, tendons in this uh, cubital fossa. Uh, you actually you need to know these things from uh, in, in that order uh, from medial to lateral, lateral to uh, medial. Um, so that is uh, about the cubital fossa. Then the carpal tunnel. Uh, so this is the area of the wrist, wrist area. Now this is these are the carpal bones. Now we said there are eight carpal bones um, uh, in uh, two rows of four. In each row there are four carpal bones. Now the carpal bones uh, will uh, form a half tunnel like this, which is completed by what is called flexor retinaculum. So this carpal tunnel, within the carpal tunnel you get many tendons of long flexors, flexor muscles starting from the forearm passing through the carpal tunnel. Uh, so this is fibrous tissue here and this is bone here. So you call it a fibro osseous tunnel, fibro osseous 
Tana. And within that, you see this nerve, median nerve passing. So this gives rise to issues sometimes because this nerve can get compressed within the carpal tunnel. Again, details will be learned later. Then the anatomical snuff box. If you extend your, your thumb, uh, extension is uh, in this direction. Uh, you will see these two types of tendons jutting out. Uh, and within the two types of tendon, you get what is called anatomical snuff box. Now, the importance of anatomical snuff box is that uh, you uh, get the, uh, the radial artery passing through it uh, and uh, there are several bones forming the flow of the anatomical snuff box. Uh, one of these bones, when it breaks, when there is a fracture of that bone, you can feel the tenderness, pain when you press, uh, uh, when that bone is fractured. So there are serious implications of uh, fracture of that bone if it is missed, uh, if you don't manage it, if it is fractured. You get part of the bone dying, uh, which is called avascular necrosis. Um, so that again, you will uh, learn the details later. Then the arterial uh, anastomosis. Uh, now I, I mentioned about the, the importance of arterial anastomosis. Now the upper limb uh, is supplied by the axillary uh, artery. Um, then you know it gives several branches, it has uh, three parts, uh, proximal, the, the first part, second part and third part. And now this is the third part of the axillary artery, third part of the axillary artery gives a branch called subscapular artery. So this is subscapular artery, then uh, it gives uh, several branches, one branch is the circumflex scapular artery. Then um, uh, in the neck there is an uh, artery called uh, subclavian artery. It gives many branches. One of its branches is the suprascapular uh, artery. Now, this suprascapular artery uh, supplies certain structures in the scapular region. It has several branches and branches of the subscapular artery here anastomose with the branches of the suprascapular artery. Uh, so, you know, there is a possibility of blood flowing from uh, this direction or this direction, but uh, sometimes you get a block in the axillary artery, uh, maybe in the second or first or second part, proximal to this third part, this is the third part. And then there is, this, if it is blocked here, then uh, a limb should die because there is no blood supply, but it is prevented by blood coming from the, sub, uh, the subclavian artery through the suprascapular artery, uh, branches of the suprascapular artery and the branches of the circumflex scapular artery uh, to the subscapular artery and then it will fill the distal part of the axillary artery and the limb will be maintained. Then about the lymph drainage of the upper limb uh, and uh, the lymph nodes uh, in relation to the upper limb, uh, the, the lymph drainage of the upper limb has uh, certain importances but uh, not, uh, not so much important. But the lymph nodes uh, that drain the, the upper limb are uh, uh, a very important group of lymph nodes which are called axillary lymph nodes. They are important uh, not because uh, they drain the upper limb but because uh, they drain the uh, breast, especially the female breast. Uh, because uh, female breast is a very uh, common site for uh, cancer, breast cancer. And when there is breast cancer, um, you can detect that with, with enlargement of uh, lymph nodes in the axillary region because it is the axillary lymph nodes that mainly drain the uh, breast. About 75% of the lymph uh, of the breast goes into the axillary lymph nodes. For that reason, axillary lymph nodes are uh, so important. Uh, there are five groups of axillary lymph nodes um, and you should know the names of these uh, five groups, uh, you can see them here. You have a central group, you have an anterior and posterior groups, uh, an apical group and a lateral group. Um, so details of this again uh, uh, for a later time. Now we will take a look at some uh, important aspects of the lower limb. Uh, first, uh, the superficial veins and uh, cutaneous nerves. Again, even though there are many superficial veins and cutaneous nerves, uh, some are important, especially cutaneous nerves, some are important, uh, others are not important. Now, uh, to start with, the first nerve 
the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve uh, you can call it lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh or lateral femoral cutaneous nerve now this nerve is important because that can get compressed here uh, there is a structure called inguinal ligament here you will learn later and it can get compressed under the inguinal ligament and you can get uh, pain uh, in that area lateral aspect of the upper part of the thigh uh, and there is a uh, name given for that condition uh, I will not uh, tell you that now uh, then uh, there is another nerve called saphenous nerve you can see it uh, that is important because uh, that is the nerve that uh, goes along with the, uh, the great saphenous vein uh, I mean uh, superficial vein of the uh, lower limb uh, the saphenous nerve accompanies great saphenous vein and uh, there are certain procedures uh, that is done on the great saphenous vein and when you do these procedures um, you will have to block uh, block the saphenous uh, nerve um, here uh, in relation to the media malleolus so for that reason saphenous nerve is uh, important to uh, remember then uh, other nerves uh, you get uh, superficial peroneal or superficial fibula same superficial peroneal nerve uh, this uh, is a, a branch of a nerve that is coming uh, from here which is called the deep peroneal nerve which has a uh, which is a common peroneal nerve which has a superficial branch and a deep branch uh, superficial branch supplies some muscles and emerge here as the uh, as a cutaneous branch um, so that is one nerve uh, and that uh, that supplies the uh, the dosum of the foot here. Uh, then there is another nerve called sural nerve. Uh, just like the saphenous nerve uh, accompanying the great saphenous vein, sural nerve accompanies another vein, important vein called the small saphenous vein. You can see the sural nerve and the small saphenous vein here uh, close to each other. Uh, so then uh, then there are some uh, other nerves that uh, you might have to remember. Uh, but for the moment we'll uh, stop uh, at this point with the nerves then the veins just like the, mm, the upper limb there is a dorsal venous arch uh, of the foot you can see the dorsal venous arch of the foot uh, from the medial aspect of the dorsal venous arch uh, uh, starts the great saphenous vein from the lateral aspect starts the small saphenous vein uh, great saphenous vein drains uh, on the medial aspect of the leg uh, passes behind the, uh, the, the patella uh, at the knee joint uh, and then ascends up uh, along the thigh and um, passes through the deep fascia of the thigh here to enter uh, what is called the femoral vein there and the small saphenous vein um, passes behind the, the lateral malleolus here on the back of the leg and uh, pierces deep pressure at the popliteal fossa this area is called the popliteal fossa and enters uh, a deep vein called popliteal vein so that so much so for the uh, superficial veins uh, of the lower limb uh, so this is another diagram to show you the arrangement of the superficial veins this is not the time to go for uh, details of the superficial veins then remember that uh, these superficial veins are connected up with deep veins there is a system of deep veins uh, especially in the calf area and the superficial venous blood drains into deep veins uh, and um, when there are issues with this uh, uh, superficial venous drainage you get what are called varicose veins dilated tortuous elongated veins of the leg all these uh, clinical aspects will be discussed uh, later on then again uh, uh, dermatomes of the lower limb just like the upper limb uh, you need to uh, know the dermatomes uh, areas of skin supplied by uh, a given um, spinal segment or spinal nerve so this is the dermatomal map uh, you have uh, l2 3 then 4 on the same side the other side 5 so 2 3 4 5 that's how you remember it uh, that is in front anterior and this is posterior uh, posterior it's a little bit uh, different it's not as simple as the anterior side um, but um, at least if you can remember the anterior side um, it's helpful and you remember the, uh, the, the, uh, how the skin or the sole of the foot is supplied S1 laterally and L5 uh, medially again so much so for the dermatomes uh, you can learn the rest of it later then about the, the, the plexus now uh, just like uh, brachial plexus uh, supplying the, uh, the upper limb uh, 
um, lambda plexus and um, uh, the, it's, it's mainly the, uh, the, the lumbar the, the part of the lumbar plexus contributing to form the lumbar sacral plexus um, and uh, that supplies the uh, uh, the lower limb um, so the lumbar uh, plexus uh, it uh, gives rise to uh, uh, several nerves one nerve is the femoral uh, nerve uh, so that is the nerve of the anterior compartment of the thigh then there is another nerve uh, which is called the, uh, the obturator nerve so this is the obturator nerve that supplies the medial compartment of the uh, thigh then uh, if you go to the sacral plexus uh, there is a very big large nerve which is called the sciatic nerve that supplies the, uh, the posterior compartment of the thigh uh, all compartments of the leg and the foot so it's a huge uh, nerve um, so remember uh, lower limb is supplied through both uh, lumbar plexus and uh, sacral plexus or rather you call it lumbar sacral plexus um, because you can see it's not only sacral segments that contributes to form the, uh, the sacral plexus uh, L4 and L5 segments from lumbar nerves also coming and joining uh, here can you see um, to contribute to form the sacral plexus therefore you can call it lumbo sacral plexus uh, then compartment of the the right thigh uh, you have uh, three compartments there are two uh, intermuscular septa lateral intermuscular septum and the medial intermuscular septum just like in the, uh, in the arm uh, and that even though there are two septa it divides the thigh into three compartments anterior compartment posterior compartment and the medial compartment uh, this is uh, anterior compartment is also called extensor uh, compartment and the posterior compartment is called uh, also called flexor compartment and the medial one is also called adductor compartment uh, and there are many muscles in these compartments as you can see here uh, detailed names of these muscles and everything we will learn uh, later one important point uh, I don't know whether it's shown here yes uh, innervation innervation means nerve supply anterior compartment is supplied by the femoral nerve as i said before which is uh, coming from the lumbar plexus then uh, the adductor compartment this one is supplied by the obturator nerve which is also coming from the lumbar plexus then the posterior compartment is supplied by the large uh, sciatic nerve which is coming from the uh, the sacral uh, plexus so this is the nerve supply uh, of the compartments of the thigh if we briefly go through uh, important regions of the lower limb uh, one important region is the femoral triangle uh, now this is the upper part of the thigh here you can see uh, now this is the, uh, the area of the abdomen and this is the uh, area of the upper part of the thigh uh, now uh, you can see a triangular area marked by these green lines so that is called the femoral triangle we expect you to know uh, the boundaries you should uh, be able to um, state the boundaries if we ask you uh, and the contents you can see this is a femoral nerve here and this is a femoral artery and this is a femoral vein uh, and the names of the muscles you will learn later so that's one uh, area um, that uh, region that you need to know as a special um, region then uh, the gluteal region the buttock uh, region um, again uh, the sciatic nerve the most important nerve the largest nerve of the body that supplies the, the posterior compartment of the thigh and all compartments of the leg and the foot uh, that nerve emerges from the gluteal region there is a certain arrangement of muscles in the gluteal region so this is an important muscle in the gluteal region which is called the, uh, the piriformis muscle uh, that is a very important landmark um, based on which you describe the other structures there are other nerves uh, the superior gluteal nerve and the inferior gluteal nerve and the vessels uh, appearing above and below the piriformis muscle uh, so the details will be learned later then the popliteal fossa just like the uh, the cubital fossa uh, in the upper limb in lying in front of the uh, the elbow popliteal fossa in the lower limb lies behind the, uh, the knee joint uh, so uh, if you remember the, the cubital fossa was a triangular area uh, the popliteal fossa is a, a diamond shaped uh, 
uh, area as you can see here again uh, it has uh, several boundaries formed by uh, muscles then uh, it, it has a flow formed by bones uh, and, and muscles and there's a roof formed by deep fascia details will be learned later and you know you can see uh, important contents uh, of the popliteal fossa like the popliteal artery vein and branches of the sciatic nerve passing through that area when it comes to joints and ligaments of the uh, of the lower limb um, ligaments of all the joints uh, the, the hip joint uh, knee joint and ankle joint uh, are important these are three main joints um, so uh, as I said before uh, when it comes to the knee joint uh, it's a flat uh, the two ends of the bones uh, end of the femur and the end of the tibia that forms the, uh, the knee joint are both flat therefore bony factors um, very minimally contribute to the um, stability of the joint it's mainly the ligaments there are very strong ligaments uh, you have cruciate ligaments then you have medial and lateral uh, lateral and medial collateral ligaments uh, you have patella ligament here and all these things will contribute to, uh, to the stability of the joint when it comes to the ankle joint again you have uh, on the medial side and on the lateral side other side you have ligaments uh, medial and lateral ligaments that maintains the joint about the arterial anastomosis uh, there is an important uh, there are two important uh, arterial anastomosis one is called uh, trochanteric anastomosis uh, other one is called cruciate anastomosis these two anastomoses uh, connect up um, uh, arteries in the, uh, the pelvic uh, cavity which is uh, the internal iliac artery to the uh, femoral artery through some of its branches which you will learn later and maintain the blood supply to the lower limb when the proximal part of the femoral artery is blocked uh, you might not understand some of these things but uh, wait for some time then you will understand so you can see this you know this is uh, the trochanteric anastomosis uh, and this is the cruciate anastomosis uh, so much for that then uh, the inguinal lymph nodes uh, inguinal lymph nodes are the lymph nodes that drain the lower limb uh, and uh, there is a way that we classify these inguinal lymph nodes uh, we classify them as uh, deep nodes and superficial nodes then the superficial nodes are further, further classified as uh, vertical and horizontal and the horizontal group is further uh, divided into a medial and a lateral group so these things you will learn later and the areas drained by these different groups you will have to uh, remember so so you get uh, the abdomen draining into the medial group it will be like that then uh, you get the lateral group uh, this uh, lateral part of the on the, the anterior abdominal wall uh, and the buttock uh, waste that area drains there and uh, and uh, you get this vertical group uh, you get all the superficial lymph draining uh, from the lower limb into the vertical group and the medial group also receive lymph from the uh, the perineal uh, area other than the anterior abdominal wall uh, so you you cannot remember it like that uh, wait for the, uh, the the practicals and then you will grasp it so, so this is the summary that I wanted to give you um, in the form of an introduction about the upper limb and lower limb. Uh, if you feel that it is too much for you at this stage, just go through it superficially and wait for the uh, real practical sessions. Initially, we will start the practical in the form of video recordings uh, done by temporary lecturers. Then later, when the faculty reopens after uh, the, the, the COVID uh, third wave, uh, we will, uh, you will go through some uh, dissections uh, so that you can catch up. Uh,